This is Life, Body, Business, Impact with Fatima. Welcome, friends. I am so grateful to have you here. I'm your host, Fatima Ingalls, fitness expert, best-selling author, lifestyle entrepreneur, founder of the Life, Body, Business, Fit Systems, and co-founder of the amazing Freedom Retreats. My mission is to positively impact 10 million lives, to inspire you to wake up and live from your bucket list of dreams instead of waking up one day with a bucket list of regrets. Get ready to be inspired with weekly episodes and interviews that disrupt your thinking and motivate you to build your best life, body and business. To change one life is to change many. So come with me now and let's get started with yours. Hey friends, welcome to today's episode where I have the privilege of interviewing the very accomplished but super down-to-earth Dr. Peter Dingle. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Dingle has helped thousands of people improve their lives by cutting through medical and health myths to give the real facts on evidence-based wellness. Dr. Dingle has worked with giants such as BHP Billiton, state governments, councils and small businesses. He presents upwards of 100 talks a year on various aspects of gut health and well-being, and has helped thousands of people become more productive. With over 30 years' experience, he leads the way in innovative wellness programs around his own university research on evidence-based wellness, motivation, and engagement triggers. Dr. Dingle has also developed a number of online programs for individuals and organisations, and is the author of 17 books on living well with a strong focus on gut health. He is bold, he's courageous, humorous and he's a straight shooter. Welcome to the show Dr Dingle. I would love for you to tell our audience a little bit more about yourself and your mission. Oh thank you Fatima, (laughs) thank you for that introduction. Look look, I'm I'm just passionate, Um, both my wife Martine and myself are just passionate about health and we are sick of seeing people sick and we're sick and tired of all this information out there. You know, people get criticized because they say something uh, and there's all this really junk information out there promoted by the governments and uh, strong vested interests on, you know, what you can't do, what you shouldn't do. But hold on. Yeah. Stop. You know, they, they, they fall short of doing anything and recommending any real good scientific based information for people. And. I just see it all the time. I'm, I just put up a couple of uh, uh, blogs this morning, or at least on, on my Facebook, and they show that, you know, if you change your diet, you can um, add something like 17% of your life to your life. That's 10, 12 to 15 years you can add on simply by changing your diet. And it's not just the years, it's the quality of life. And one of the biggest problems I find is people are so confused. You know, they're, they're told to, uh, you know, eat the breakfast cereals, they're good for you. And then uh, the, the various research institutes that have their money in the, you know, their, 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 their money in the pockets of the big companies and so on are telling them to, oh, yeah, breakfast foods are fine and drink a bit of that, it's fine. It's not. You know, we're killing ourselves. We're slowly, uh, well, not even slowly, we're surely eating ourselves and, and leading a lifestyle that's killing us. And it's not complex, it's not hard, and small changes can make a big difference over a long period of time. But we've just got to get this information through there. And, you know, with the talks that you mentioned, the talks that we do, people, we've had people who have had gut issues, they're on gut medications for 27 years that they're supposed to be on for a few months maximum. And they come up and they go, wow, why didn't someone tell me? Why didn't someone tell me that reflux isn't too much acid? It's to lower acid? Why didn't someone tell me that you can just add this and it'll make a difference here? Why didn't someone, you know? And the problem is we have a system that's geared towards waiting till people get very, very sick before we do anything and then we give them pharmaceuticals that literally they mask the symptoms. So they're not doing anything. They mask the symptoms. And as a result, people go, oh, oh yeah, yeah I, I feel better. Uh, and then as a result, two or three drugs later, they're on another drug to uh, treat the drugs that they're on. And, you know, the average 60-year-old now in Australia is on six medications. 
I'm just over 60, so someone's taking my six. Um, you know, that's a, that's a crazy thing, and it's normal. It's accepted. I've had people who, uh, every time they go to the doctor, they, they go on a drug, and then uh, they they come to our talks, they go off the drugs, and at, you know, 80 years plus of age, they're still on no medications. But each time, the pharmaceutical system has caught up with them and said, oh, you better take this and put the fear of God, whereas, you know, it really should be the fear of eating poorly and the fear of a poor lifestyle that drives, that really drives um, health and well-being in our country. So that that's what Hafetami asked me, what drives me, common sense. But what's also important is, you know, as a researcher, as a, an ex-associate professor of a university where I was there for um, 25 years, I, I can tell you there is plenty of research. There is you know, hundreds upon hundreds of studies on all of these topics to, for how food can lower blood pressure, how life, lifestyle can alter this fact, how, you know, uh, simple things like fibre can reduce the incidence of diabetes type 1. So, yeah. you know, we, we've got the evidence. It's just that the, 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 the medical industry doesn't allow it out. And, the you know, only be, only because a dozen studies have been done, not the 500 and the and the big ones that cost billions of dollars and sponsored by the pharmaceutical. But the evidence is there. We don't have to get sick. It's a choice. And it's a choice of what we eat, what we surround ourselves with in our environment and our lifestyle. Uh, and of course, our attitude, which is something you're big on as well. Absolutely. Like I completely agree with you in relation to the Band-Aid solutions, I guess, which really aren't solutions when you go through um, the medical system, and obviously there's exceptions to every rule, but generally they look for Band-Aid solutions, which really aren't solutions at all, instead of getting to that core of the problem, which is obviously what you like to do, which is really, really exciting. The other thing you mentioned was 17% extra life. Is that what you said? Yep, 17%. That's a that's a pretty good. You know? So I, I you know at the bottom of the little article I put. So how how serious are about your health and your eating? And look, I'm serious. I want to add that 17 percent. Now that's an average. So hopefully I can get to another 20 or 30 percent. Because uh, I'm not. Right <laughs> I mean, who doesn't want to add another 17 percent of life? Especially if you are living with energy and confidence and vibrant a vibrancy, and you're able to get out there and and be nice and active. I guess there is so much information and confusing information out there, but with the age of the internet these days, I believe people are having the ability to become, to become better informed so that when they do go and visit um, a medical professional, they have a little bit more information or they can do a bit more research and ask more questions so that they, they can make better choices. And I think that's part of what is really, really important. And with what you're doing, educating people, uh, that is so powerful. The education is powerful so that they can make informed decisions. You know, the, un the unfortunate thing about that model is that is that people still, you know, well, we're, we're, I suppose the younger generation is questioning the medical system more, but the older generation, those, you know, post-65, the, the baby boomers and so on, are still caught up in that model that, you know, they can't question their doctor. And yet what's really interesting is, Many of them will question some facts and figures and I'll show them the studies and, and they'll still say, but my my doctor said so. Uh, and I go, well, show me the evidence. Show me the evidence. I can, you know, in, in the in the books that I write, in the talks that I do, um, you know, this morning alone already I've reviewed, you know, or today alone I've already reviewed, you know, 20, 20 studies and so on and gone into depth on two or three of them um, all about health. All I do is look for the evidence on it, and the evidence is there. And it may not be very strong yet because, you know, it's, it's always coming out. But uh, you, you see, um, particularly in the area that I'm working on now, gut health, you see just so much coming out now every single day. So there's, there's this – I'm constantly being supported by what I've said and what I say, by the new research that is just coming out time and time again. And the hardest part of all this is getting people to question the medical system. Show me the evidence. You know, if you take cholesterol-lowering drugs like statins, they don't reduce your risk of a heart attack or stroke by 30%. They reduce it by, if you're lucky, half a percent. And the side effects are 2 or 3%. And some of them, devastating. And people don't ask and question. They just believe the government and the medical system 
that they believe they're all out there looking after them. I'm sorry, it's all locked in with vested interests. And that's what we do. You know, we don't have a vested interest. I don't sell products. I sell information. We sell books, yeah. And and uh, we, 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 you know, talk about how to make healthy smoothies and some, some good things you can eat and consume and do things to enhance your health. But, you know, we're not locked into, well, I need to sell these drugs and these drugs will then sell and I'll make a profit and the industry will then fund me and support me. And that's how the system is right through from our education system. They're trained by people who have worked in the pharmaceutical industry and have worked for the pharmaceutical companies. So what what else can you expect except a change that's driven by the public, driven by you, Fatima, driven by all the like minded people like you and me. uh, And slowly just getting people to ask the question, show me the evidence. Yeah, look, Peter, I was one of those people who would go to the doctor and just, well, whatever the doctor said was what I would do because I thought the doctor knew best. And they are, I guess they are influenced by those big companies because there is a lot of money to be made and a lot of money to be lost by people getting educated and learning how to heal themselves from the inside out with real food. I don't even like calling it real food because it's food, but... It will term it real food because there is so much packaged food out there which is damaging our body these days. So it should just be eat food um, yeah. as opposed to having to call it term it real food. Health food. Yeah, what's what's this healthy food bit? It's not. It's, you know, what we've got is food and unhealthy food. We've yeah. got food and sick foods. And we need to turn around and go, well, if it doesn't resemble what we should what we should be eating, what our great grandparents ate, what our ancestors a thousand years ate, then it's probably not food. And in that case, it's sick food. It's the stuff that'll make you uh, it'll make you just make you sicker. Yeah, look, I was one of these people who ate a lot of the packaged food and um, it took me getting autoimmune disease, having vitiligo and alopecia to um, make a change in my own life to start to question the doctors and and the specialists and go well that doesn't make sense I know something's happening on the inside of my body why am I putting you know a cream on the outside of my body and coming to see you in three weeks time so that set me off on on a path of asking questions and looking for common sense information um, which completely changed my life and the way I live my life and the way I've raised and am raising my children I'd really love to um, talk a little bit more about gut health. Gut health seems to be a real buzz topic these days, but it's super important. Why and how is it impacting people's overall health and happiness? And I know you've got books and courses and things on this, so I'd love for you to share a bit more on this. Well, look, interestingly enough, it's 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 not a, it's not one of those trendy topics because um, uh, it was the cornerstone of health uh, two and a half thousand years ago. And if you look at the the records in every culture, whether it's Chinese, um, Egyptian, Greek with, um, you know, Hippocrates, uh, any of those cultures thousands of years ago, they always referred to the gut. If someone got sick, they got them to do a purge. Um, Even in animals, when animals, chimpanzees get sick, one of the first things they do is turn to certain plants that work on the gut. And... Up until about 100 years ago, the gut was the focus. And really, with the, again, the drive in pharmaceuticals, um, uh, probably about 70 years ago, just to change that emphasis. So we, we, we've just lost track. It's not a new trend. It's an old trend, a consistent trend that we've had. We've just lost track for 50 years. Now, why the gut is so important, I suppose there are many, many reasons. But if you understand that our genetic information that controls our body is made up by a small amount in our cells called the DNA and a large amount, a hundred times more, by the DNA in the microorganisms. We are so complex and the DNA in our cells can't explain everything. What we can explain is that the gut DNA, the microorganisms in our gut, the bacteria that you've all heard of like bifido and lactobacillus and maybe a good uh, fungi called saccharomyces or the bad bacteria called helica, whatever, they all can actually change our expression of our genes and alter how our body works and inter- interacts. And we know, for example, through this genetic, the genetics in the gut microbe, they can have this interplay with a whole raft of mechanisms in our body. And everyone's heard of the gut-brain axis. And they've heard, they probably haven't heard of the gut immune axis. They probably haven't heard of the gut skin axis. The gut, you know, the gut 
plays a role in virtually, in fact, I can't think of a cell that it doesn't. It plays a role with every organ system in the body, every system in the body, and it links in with it. Even, even today, I, w- I was looking at some, uh, some studies on, uh, on acne, and they found that one of the major treatments, dermal treatments, that um, is basically a vitamin A overdose that they put on the skin works by changing the gut, my, sorry, the, the, the skin microbiome. So hold on, <laughs> this, this dermal treatment works by treating the skin and changing the conditions so different bacteria grow, the healthier bacteria grow. And so it comes back to the microbiome of the skin, which, by the way, comes back to the microbiome of, 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 the, uh, of the gut. In, when we look at the gut, uh, a lot of people would have heard of the concept of leaky gut. And leaky gut is when toxic chemicals from the, the wrong type of bacteria and viruses and molds, the chemicals and even parts of the bacteria and the bacteria and these microbes can get through into the blood. Arthritis is primarily caused by this leaky gut. And uh, people are going, hold on, I've got this pain. How can it be? What's really interesting, I, know, I, I came to this conclusion about arthritis because um, I wanted to see how they actually create animals. So they create animals to have arthritis by altering their gut health. And then they treat it with drugs to see how to fix it. Now, this is how stupid the system is. Wow. Why won't you just make sure people have got healthy gut? And you're probably aware of people who have taken some collagen and had a benefit in terms of their gut health and or people who have fixed their gut and all of a sudden their their arthritis has started to disappear after after being you know having pain for 27 years or something it's it's just so obvious the link between the gut and all of these problems and the gut is the major cause of inflammation and oxidation which is the major cause of all illness so that's the gut arthritis, the gut joint, the gut bone axis. Then there's the gut brain axis. And everybody has heard about this one, you know, where we now know that um, on, the, on the neurological diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, gut plays a huge role. In fact, naturopath and health and the, the complementary health professionals have known for over 100 years that Parkinson's disease is caused by dysbiosis, a, an upset or a dysregulation of the gut microbiome. So we can actually prevent, you're right, we can prevent 50% of Parkinson's in the world by fixing the gut. Wow. You'd think everyone would be jumping up and down and going out there. See, people hear about this gut brain, but they don't understand the implications. And this is what I what I try to get across. It's not just knowing it. And then we've got all these other conditions, uh, you know, we've got mental health uh, conditions, uh, anxiety, stress, depression, bipolar, all these, and they're all linked to the gut as well. They're all linked to the gut. And, you know, the gut produces um, the majority of the body's uh, neurotransmitters. So things like serotonin, which everybody knows, uh, other uh, neurotransmitters that affect how your body stays in balance and keeps happy and doing all these things. Uh, are generated and moderated and controlled through. So if you want um, a healthy mind and attitude, yeah, it's not going to all disappear just by fixing the gut because there are a lot of social, psychological, emotional issues tied up in it. But one of the first steps people can do is fixing the gut for mental health, mental health illness. You know, we should, everybody with a with a mental health condition, and and that's, Probably about uh, everybody because we all go through some anxiety and stress and um, depressed like symptoms and depression at some stage every year. The facts I, I, I were reading yesterday saying it's about you know 25% every year, but I'd suggest it's probably every year. Can all be improved to some degree from 5% or 95% by working on the gut and fixing the gut. And then, then as I said, with arthritis, wow. And the, the point is all of these conditions come from the same treatment fixing the gut and i'm on about it now what does fixing the gut mean well you know it's a little bit it's a little bit complicated we you know we we can't say precisely for everyone what to do there are there are lots of things you can do and you know we can work towards it then you've got your immune system all the autoimmune diseases all of the autoimmune diseases are literally caused or linked to the gut uh diabetes type one recent studies and we're talking the last five years 
So all these diabetes professionals out there won't know what it's all about. But all these diabetes professionals literally do not know yet that the gut is linked to the gut is linked to diabetes type one. And uh, one of the studies out there demonstrated that simply by altering the fiber content in mice dramatically reduce the incidence of diabetes type 1 in these mice who are prone to get diabetes type 1. Now, that was just fiber. Imagine, imagine what we could do if we took it one step further and added some other things in there to, to work with it. So we know these, you know, fibromyalgia, um, uh, another autoimmune disease, uh, arthritis, which I've already, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, which I've already mentioned, asthma, allergies have all been linked to the gut. So you've got this gut immune system link out there so again there's there's not one part um if you just start fixing the gut as far as i can tell virtually all cancers are lowered even even um stuff on on your respiratory system the gut lung link and they they know that um not just asthma which is an allergic condition but things like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, can be improved by fixing the gut health because what happens We've we've actually got a gut mic sorry a, a a lung microbiome and the lung microbiome so all these microorganisms we we used to think that the lungs were you know nice and clean and pure and sterile well we now know that's incorrect and the type of bacteria in your respiratory system in your lungs determine not just your susceptibility to colds and flus and viruses um, and infections but also long-term chronic illness in your respiratory system, such as, as I said, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer, all of these conditions, they, they link back to the gut. Because again, the major source of, of uh, microorganisms in and around the body come from the gut. Uh, ear, nose and throat infections, um, ear, ear infections in kids. You know, the worst thing you can do, one of the worst things you can do for an ear infection in kids is treat it with antibiotics. The research shows it doesn't work. Uh, but what it does do is disturbs the gut microbiome and the other microbiomes in the body so much so that you're more likely to get more ear infections. What's the answer? Well, work on fixing the microbiomes, particularly the gut microbiome. The, and the microbiome is just, the, you know, the, the culture, the hundred the supposedly 100 trillion or 40 trillion microorganisms in the gut, the, you know, the 400, 300, 500 different types of microorganisms in the gut, and, and regaining that diversity of them all, like what our ancestors had. And the best way I tell people to do that is, you know, literally eating, eating a diversity of rich gut-healthy foods. So all of these conditions link back to the gut. In fact, I can't find a condition that is not linked to the gut. Diabetes type 2, all your metabolic illnesses. Studies, studies, studies have demonstrated that by changing the gut microbiome, you can get as much as a 50% reduction in diabetes type 2. So we're talking, Fatima, from, from an economic perspective, for small changes that won't cost you anything over a week or a month or even a life, small changes can alter your health condition. Like I said, right in the beginning, living longer, living healthier, living with more energy and vibrancy by working on the gut first. So it's just that, it's incredible, isn't it? Um, what the gut such... health is linked to. I mean, there are a few things. A few of the things you spoke about, I was uh, quite aware of, but there were some others, like the link with the lungs that I that's completely new to me I had not uh, come across that information before so um, for people who may think they could possibly have leaky gut how does someone go about finding out what are the signs and symptoms or what would they do to find out and then what are two or three things that they could implement so as not to be overwhelmed that can have impactful changes on their gut health Okay, look, the, the simple thing is, if, uh, how, how do people find out if they've got leaky gut? The simple way is, um, uh, are, are they living in a modern world? Oh, hold on, they've probably got leaky gut to some degree. And the reality is there are so many stresses and pressures on our gut in general that, you know, we need to constantly work on rebuilding it and reworking it. Um, it might be some, uh, all the antibacterials, that we've been brainwashed, stupidly brainwashed to use, um, things with triclosan and 
um, you know, all these other chemicals that are constantly poisoning our skin microbiome, our gut microbiome, our lung microbiome. Every time you spray one of these chemicals in the air to kill the bacteria or disinfect, um, you're breathing it in and then destroying your gut microbiome, which is most likely going to increase your susceptibility to lung conditions later on in life. Not now, but 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the line. So, you know, if you live in the 21st century, if you're eating modern foods, one of the, one of the major food additives called emulsifiers was thought up until five years ago, in 2013, they thought emulsifiers were pretty well inert. Emulsifiers enable you to mix fat and water together. So it doesn't look like there's a layer of fat and a layer of uh, water. It's mixed together, so it doesn't look gluggy and glunky and ugly and, you know, distasteful. Well, what happens is these emulsifiers now, apparently, and again, there's a dozen studies on this since 2013 that I could find, that, that they, they emulsify what's called the mus mucin layer, the mucus layer between, which is a protective barrier between your, your, your gut wall which is just one cell thick, and your bacteria are on the other side, and all of the, um, the let's say, the, uh, the feces and all those other smelly things that are there. There's only one cell layer and a mucin layer. And what happens is if this mucin layer, or mucus layer, as you would know it, is, um, it deteriorates, then all the toxins can start to poison the, the gut wall. And uh, we found out that one of the things that break down this mucin layer uh, it literally is the is the um, some of the food additives, in particular the emulsifiers. So all of a sudden, everything that's got emulsifier in is now a gut poison. Uh, um, Roundup, glyphosate, everyone's heard of years. Well, in in two thousand and three, I think it was, it was classified as an antibiotic. It's it's it actually is an antibiotic. It's one of its primary toxic actions on humans and animals is destroying the gut microbiome. Uh, and then you've got stress and you've got lifestyle and then, you, then you've got the foods. If you're not feeding your gut, you're starving them. And when the, when the gut is starved of things as simple as fibre, Fatima, fibre, when it's starved of fibre, the, the microbiome, the microorganisms in the gut eat the mucus layer for a food source. And if they eat too much of it, it gets too close to the barrier, the gut wall, and the damage, as I said, starts to occur. So if you're eating any of these processed foods that have no fiber in them at all, um, then you've got damaged gut. And the results of research show that, you know, just, just a, a couple of hours later of, after eating stuff, um, there are small changes. And if this is happening every single day, then this is large changes over, over weeks, months, years, and a lifetime. The good thing is it also shows that small changes made over a lifetime can make a positive influence and difference too. And this is where, okay, so what are some, some things you can do? Well, the obvious thing is stop eating processed foods. Yeah. Stop eating yeah. processed foods. You know, I know it's a no-brainer. And look, have them, have them uh, once a week, you know, twice a week, three times a week. But remember, every time you do, it feeds the wrong type of microbiome. And poison's a good one. So you just want to minimize it. And people say, oh, well, start slowly. And on the other side of that, eat more fruit, eat more veggies, eat more nuts, beans, and all these other great foods out there that, are, that, are, that feed the gut. Now, uh, again, I've been doing a lot of work on fruit. Fruit gets a bit of a bad rap. They say uh, two pieces of fruit. Let me tell you, the research on fruit is overwhelming. Eat more fruit. Uh, and uh, I, I was reading a study just a couple of days ago showing that the more fruit that you ate, the more diversity you had in the gut microbiome. And biodiversity in the gut microbiome means healthiness. So the more fruit, the healthier the gut, the healthier the person. So when somebody says, oh, your child's eating two pieces of fruit, don't let them eat any more. You know, I'm sorry. You know, I'm I'm sorry. Eat more. Just eat a diversity of fruit. Don't just eat all, uh, you know, all of um, one type of uh, cherry or something. Bananas and avocados have been repeatedly to be shown up as great microbiome foods. Uh, so, you know, uh, eat, just eat this great diversity of fruit, veggies, nuts and beans. And, uh, you know, on, on the other topic, add, add some fiber. 
So add some fibre. And then I, I suppose I've probably got to about five or six different hints for people. And, and you can just do one one bit of fruit a day extra. That's That's how much, that's all it takes to start building up and then getting rid of one toxic food a day. Uh, and then from, you know, the environmental perspective, I'm going to save you money here. Stop buying all those toxic products that you find on the supermarket shelf. Every time you apply a chemical to your skin, to the air, to the surface in your home, you're poisoning your gut microbiome. And as a result, your skin and lung microbiome. And as a result, your health. So it's a pretty simple equation. Eat well, uh, eat better, eat less of the, the processed foods um, and, and, eat, and literally have more of the, uh, the fiber and nutrient dense foods and then get rid of those ones that poison the gut, get rid of those things in your home and you'll, you'll save hundreds of dollars a year with the, the advice I've given you. Yeah, that's super, super helpful for our listeners. I guess not only is it saving you money, but it's also impactful on the environment by buying less processed food, less packaging, less chemicals, all of that sort of stuff into the environment. Kombucha and kimchi, there's a lot of people who talk about it and, and use it in their diet these days. What are your thoughts on that in relation to gut health? Great. I think they're great. And, and the, the, reason, the reason is that um, if you have yogurt, for example, you'll get two or three strains of bacteria, maybe three or four or five in a really good one. But your gut microbiome, its health is determined by the number, the sheer biodiversity, like a rainforest. And I, I try to get this across in my talks. You know, it's like a rainforest. And to feed a rainforest, you do, don't just put in one or two or three or four animals in there or plants. You put in hundreds, thousands, even more. And the good thing about kombucha and, and these fermented foods, even your even your apple cider vinegar mother, you know, with the mother in organic foods and stuff like that, um, all of them, they'll have 50 to 100 different types of uh, probiotics in them. Low doses, low doses, much lower than you get in yogurt and the probiotic uh, powders and things, but but it's the biodiversity. And then if you feed them on top of that, you encourage them to grow. So you don't need many as long as you're feeding them. And the problem is people are taking um, probiotics. Uh, and look, I'm, I'm a big believer in it, taking probiotics. But if you're having probiotics and white bread or kombucha and white bread, you're wasting your time and your money. It's got to be high fiber. And, you know, high fiber, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to a simple solution. Um, Rye Vita, okay, this is a plug, I don't get, I've got no commercial, Rye Vita is, is um, 15% fibre, one of the highest, simple, cheapest foods, you know, you can buy and everyone thinks, oh, it tastes yuck, well, hey, get over it, your gut, love it, something as simple as that can add fibre to your diet um, and, and, and start to improve it and then you have the kombucha and the kefir uh, and these other um, fermented foods and they add to the bacteria. And of the ones that get through, there's the food for them to eat. And as a result, they can start to grow. So it's about having those fermented foods and the foods to keep them healthy. Okay. And supplementing with probiotics as well. That's something that I did uh, as a part of healing my own autoimmune disease. I had very, very unhealthy gut due to the lifestyle that I had led for so many years, eating so many biscuits and chocolate on the daily. Um, I had to work really hard to to heal my gut, to heal my own autoimmune issues. And taking a probiotic supplement was a really big part of that. So what are your thoughts on that? Look, absolutely, absolutely. For the healing process and crisis and on a, on a regular but not not as an intensive basis, you know, um, any anyone with, uh, with gut dysbiosis, which is most people, you can kickstart the process. By, by taking high dose probiotics. And uh, again, there's a lot of confusion out there because they go, well, what, what type? You know, they, this, this uh, naturopath said that, my doctor said that, the, the chemist said this. Uh, the, the, look, in, in most cases, the, um, the research tends to show that if you just take two high strain common bacteria, gut microbiome probiotics, it balances out the microbiome so that all of the good ones can support each other. 
So just by taking, you know, a bifidobacteria and a lactobacillus, uh, it will help rebalance the gut microbiome and the goodies can take over from the bad. The goodies work in concert. The opportunistic or bad bacteria and, and, and fungi work in concert too. So what you want to do is just add more uh, players, more of the good concert by starting it for the probiotics. And when they start taking over and poisoning the bad bacteria, the opportunistic ones, the, the good ones, the good ones start to share a bit of space together. And then you had the biodiversity with the kombucha and the kefir and the, all the other fermented foods and things like that. And it adds on to it. So, you know, it, it's about uh, understanding, but can specific probiotics be a benefit? Yes, in some situations. They've shown some probiotics to be more beneficial in, let's say, uh, bipolar. Um, but my take on the whole situation for the vast majority of, of people, just taking high dose probiotics will work. And, however, you still have to feed it. You're still going to make sure, and it's not just prebiotics like a lot of people have heard now, it's all types of the fiber. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you, again, I told you bananas are a great fiber, um, pr, you know, food for the gut. Uh, potatoes are too. They get a bit of a bad rap. Potatoes. Right. Um, I love potatoes. <laughs> no, they, get, they get this bad rap because, oh, no, they're full of, they're full of um, uh, carbohydrates. And so I'm sorry, folks, they're good carbs. The bacteria like them. They've got a lot of non, um, you know, resistant starch in them which feeds the gut microbiome. Um, when they become bad is obviously when you deep fry them, you chip them and do all those other processed things to them. Um, probably mashing, mashing potatoes isn't, isn't a great way to have them. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the point is the foods that our great-great-grandparents ate are good for us and our microbiome thrive and, and you know, they, they live on it. So we need to just have it. But, again, uh, not just potatoes. Um, the greatest diversity of food Healthy foods leads to the greatest diversity of the microbiome, which is the greatest health impact. Okay, so key, eat a variety of whole foods, um, and that will make a massive impact. There's been so much um, valuable information and actionable steps that you have actually provided in the last 30 minutes. So I thank you so much for that because that will be very valuable. Uh, I'd love to shift gears a little bit now and talk a little bit about cosmetics and how it affects the chemicals in cosmetics affect um, our hormones in men and women. One of your books is Cosmetics and Personal Care, Dangerous Beauty. It's one of the books I do have and have referenced a lot to make some changes um, in our own home. So if, could you tell us a little bit more about how the chemicals in our cosmetics and beauty products do affect our hormones? Well, look, that, it's, that's interesting because I actually started off my work as a as a scientist, um, you know, uh, probably what was it, 25, 30 years ago, looking into toxic chemicals, and that led me into the home toxic chemicals, and then it led me into the personal care ones because we're putting them on our skin. Now, I've gone full circle in a sense in that the, the you know I, I then started looking at well, hold on, this isn't the answer. It's not explaining everything, and I started looking at nutrition and gut health. And what's interesting is many of these chemicals that are applied to the skin can affect our gut health as well, both directly, as in poisoning the gut, and indirectly by altering the chemical messengers in our body. Now, I want to take one little step back, and I just want to sh uh, share with people that your biggest endocrine gland, that is your uh, gland or, or the part of your body that produces most of your hormones, is your gut. And ladies, estrogen is regulated by your gut, controlled um, by your gut. So fixing your gut for a lot of women will help um, with a lot of those uh, uh, hormone type issues as well. Now, what happens is when you take, when you put on personal care products, most people can't read the labels, don't read the labels, or um, most people will just whack them on thinking it's okay. Probably half of the ingredients that we, that, that we put on our skin are going to have some toxic effect. And the point is, uh, we apply it now so much. I think I, I think the figures are something like 100. The average uh, U.S. Uh, woman applies 186 different chemicals to their skin every single day. That's not products. That's that's only 10 products or 15 products or something like that. And they don't even think they don't even you know um, uh, consider it in any way. And everything they put on alters and interacts with each other to change the skin and enable some of these other chemicals to get into the skin, through the skin, 
and into the blood. Now, when these chemicals are in the blood, they can play havoc with lots of other conditions around your body. But the first thing is your skin, like your gut, has a microbiome. And if you're putting this stuff on your skin constantly, you are causing problems with your skin microbiome. So you have to make sure it's going to look after your microbiome, feed it, not poison it. Now, it, the second layer of that is your skin is actually a huge immune system organ. So all of your immune system, you, you, you know, you've got these, these little cells right underneath your skin, like you do in your gut, that respond to certain reactions. And so hence you've got your atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, and all these other conditions out there, skin conditions, which in many cases are, 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 are you know, your skin immune system, as well as your overall innate immune system reacting. Uh, and so these chemicals can alter it, change it, cause these problems down the line. And you end up putting more and more chemicals on your skin to cover the problems caused by the chemicals that you put on the skin. It's a it's a no win, lose lose situation. And then it gets through into the blood. And these chemicals are, you know, they're 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 linked with many conditions. And probably the most common one are what we call the endocrine disrupting chemicals. These are the chemicals that can get in there and mimic your hormones. Your endocrine system is your hormone system. Everyone, ladies, you know about your thyroid. And, uh, and these chemicals get in there and can alter the expression of estrogen, other hormones as well, but alter the expression of estrogen receptors on your cells and things so that it thinks there's too much estrogen in there or, or um, an imbalance in the estrogen. And as a result, end up with all these estrogen related diseases, e.g. everything from breast cancer right through to polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis. Uh, ladies, if you're listening, you know what it is. Gentlemen, prostate cancer. All these are altered by these chemicals that go in your body. Now, thyroid conditions. Uh, I find it amazing that there are so many chemicals in our personal care and, and, and cosmetics that can alter the thyroid activity, our hormones. And what's surprising is one of the best-selling drugs on the market in the US right at this point in time is a thyroid, a synthetic thyroid drug, which processes or mimics thyroid hormones because the thyroid has been poisoned over a lifetime of um, chemical use. And people don't get it. They don't get it. So by the time they turn 30, 40 or 50, they're going on these thyroid drugs uh, because they're consuming, putting chemicals on their skin and fluoride in water, by the way, which is a thyroid poison. Um, they're putting it on them, uh, they're, they're, they're eating it, they're coming across it, and it's destroying their thyroid, which is destroying their balance of hormones in the body. And then all of a sudden thinking, well, I can take a drug for the rest of my life um, without side effects. Wrong. Wrong. So the best option is to look at these chemicals that you're applying to your skin and say, well, hold on, these are endocrine disrupting chemicals. There, there are things called parabens. There are things called phthalates. Um, something else called BPA, bisphenol A, and you'll see a lot of um, plastics now, they'll say BPA free. But the problem is they've got all these other BPs in there, BPS and so on, which are probably just as bad. We just haven't done the research. So people are saying, well, what do I do with the plastics? Well, use less. Use less of them. When it comes to the cosmetics and personal care, use safer brands, ones that not only literally have um, you know, mention they don't have parabens and phthalates, uh, but also have done the research to show they don't. So, uh, some recent research in the US demonstrated that about 50% um, of the products out there that say no parabens and no phthalates in them uh, actually have parabens and phthalates because they don't even know. Because you'll find they're actually put in things with fragrances. So one of my one of my easiest solutions is apply products that don't have a fragrance or make sure it's been tested so that the fragrance doesn't have the parabens or the phthalates. And these chemicals are added because um, it makes them smoother and more lustrous on the skin. Uh, it, it acts as a pres they, they act as a preservative. They help with the stability of the product. You know, there's a raft of reasons. But increasingly, you'll find a lot of companies are now turning around and saying, well, we've got rid of the parabens. We've got rid of the phthalates. We've, we're no longer doing BPA uh, plastics out there, you know, we're, we're, we're getting rid of it. Um, you'll find a lot of the companies who toothpaste and all those, we've got, got rid of triclosan, for example, which are, is an antibacterial. Um, what does triclosan do? What sort of what? effect does it have 
um, in a person's body. Well, tri triclosan is, is a very effective antibacterial. And again, we now know that everything in our body, as I've just explained to it, runs on bacteria, your skin microbiome. You've even got a hair microbiome. You've got a, you know, your, a urinary tract micro, a placenta microbiome. And if you're applying these poisons every day, which can get through into the skin, through with the skin, but if you're applying them um, uh, in, a, in a toothpaste, for example, uh, or, or as a cream, or some other product around the, around the house, then you are constantly disrupting your microbiome. Now, on top of that, triclosan has shown to be a, to have some endocrine disrupting chemicals or activity. Now, I don't know if that's because it disturbs the gut microbiome or because the particular activity of that chemical gets in and mimics estrogen. So, you know, but what we do know is it does cause that. And again, applying all these antibacterials to anywhere around the house is just an absurdity. We've been brainwashed. Um, all those wipes that people see at the supermarkets, um, uh, you know, wipe down your trolley. I'm sorry, folks. The more bacteria, the greater the diversity of bacteria you're exposed to, the healthier you are. Now, obviously, in, in enclosed environments and uh, hospitals and uh, even cruise ships, you know, you've got to be a bit more careful with all of this. But in the general, Get more bacteria exposure. Get rid of those antibacterial. You know they're, they're just not working. And triclosan is a good example. But but many but many of those chemicals that you know we apply will actually have uh, antibacterial properties. All right. So with this question, I guess is probably more specifically for women, women trying to get pregnant and pregnant women. If you're using these personal care products in the bathroom and in the home. How, how can this affect your unborn child? Can it affect your unborn child? Well, look, um, uh, look I, I, uh, without, without giving it a plug, I wrote a very extensive section on this on, on, uh, in the book Dangerous Beauty. But what, what was really apparent was that the first and foremost thing is it lowers fertility. So if you're trying to get pregnant, uh, and, and we've, we've got to realise now that the, the, in, the level of infertility is increasing. And what's really interesting, they did some animal experiments over a couple of generations and showed that this infertility is passing on from generation to generation, generation, probably or at least partly as a result of the gut microbiome, the, the loss of species in your gut microbiome with each generation. But they're finding that this infertility is being passed on. And so the next generation of toxic chemical users personal care products are becoming more infertile, both from the male and female perspective, because, you know, these chemicals alter your hormones and your hormones govern for both male and female fertility. And there are lots of other things in there, too. However, then let's assume you're pregnant, uh, ladies, then in, in this case, uh, these chemicals will determine the development of your child. The hormones, um, you know, in, 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 in a woman's body during pregnancy will, will determine many, many, many factors right through from um, energy levels to type of nutrients available to um, uh, the, the feeling of stress and so on in the baby. All of these are altered by altering the, the Im or creating an imbalance in these chemicals in utero, in the womb. And so, uh, you know, there have been there are studies now showing that um, um, children exposed to certain endocrine disruptors, like parabens and phthalates, are more likely to have uh, complications as they grow up and even later in life in terms of cancers. And this gets a bit scary because we now know that it gets scary, can't it? I mean, well, yeah, but, this, you know, be, I, oh my I, god, <laughs> there's so much to do, there's so much to change. This can sound quite overwhelming, but I guess we'll we'll get it can really be overwhelming for people. But all you've got to ask the question is, how long have we been using all these products? It's like our food. How long? It's not, you know, poor health is not normal. Applying chemicals to the skin ten times a day is not normal. It's normal now. 50 years ago, it was 60 years ago, it was rare. 200 years ago, it was non existent unless you were rich and you usually died young in the aristocracy 200 years ago, died young because of the chemicals they put on their skin. 
We didn't, we've never learned. And what's happening is people are constantly being brainwashed, to, you know, to look more beautiful than whatever else or to have cleaner, whiter skin or, or hair or, 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 or teeth or something. You need to apply more chemicals. The answer is no, it's less and it's safer chemicals. And so um, that my, my message is, look, it's not complex. It's just about looking around and not getting rid of everything at once because, uh, you know, I often have my, my students used to come up at university and go, oh, my parents hate me now. Uh, they hate me, that is, because um, the kids went home and threw everything out. You know, I'm talking university students, by the way, not kids. But um, so my message is to get rid of them slowly. We don't need them. And we're just being brainwashed. Turn off the ads. Turn off the TV. The same with the junk foods. The junk food ads work exactly the same. The more ads, the more junk food consumed. And I'm not just talking um, uh, McDonald's now. I'm talking breakfast cereals, Milo. It, they're junk foods. Forget that crappy bit of information. Oh, good source of calcium. Absolute rubbish and bunkum. They are a poison for the gut microbiome. There is. I can't find a redeeming feature, and they're constantly advertised as being healthy or, you know, good for you or constantly just advertised. Those breakfast cereals that the kids eat are poisoning their gut. If you, if you need a breakfast cereal, do a porridge, do a muesli. Uh, and if the kids don't like it, don't worry, keep feeding them. They'll learn to like it. And when it comes to the chemicals, just reassess it and say, well, do I need to apply so much uh, so often? And can I find a cheaper one? Uh, it might be a bit more expensive, but if I apply it less, uh, it'll be the same cost. And again, the real cost is later in life, um, whether it's the acne develops because you're poisoning the skin or it's the, uh, or it's the um, uh, health conditions 40 or 50 years down the line because of, of these chemicals and the effect on the gut microbiome. It's, it's, it, look, if you don't invest in your health now, you will pay for it later. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, if people wanted to make some changes to their bathroom and starting small, what would you say are the maybe the top three offenders, the top three things that if they want to make some, start making some changes that they should change now? Well, I'd say toothpaste is the first one because you're putting it, you're putting it in your mouth. Uh, and you are taking some into your digestive system straight away and in the mouth. It's the mucus layer there is very, very small and things are absorbed through very, very quickly. So you're going to put something in your mouth, make sure it doesn't have fluoride um, and a whole raft of other chemicals in there like sodium lauryl sulfate, DEA, TEA. Uh, just look at the back of them. Um, fluoride is a hormone poison. It's a thyroid poison and it's in toothpaste. No, it's not good for the teeth. It's good for poisoning thyroid and other cells in your body. So get rid of of the toxic toothpaste. That's the first one. The second one is you just use less soap. Use less shampoo. The problem with shampoos is that they change the pH and literally the microbiome of the hair and the and, and the head and alter it so that you know you now your body's trying to recuperate because you're washing it every day or twice a day uh, and it's producing more of these oils and it's getting more and more dry because of what we're doing to it. It's much better off just using less of the products and safer products, as I said. So the, the shampoos, the soaps and so on. Look, and, and, and the soap is probably the simplest one. You don't actually need to apply it uh, and, unless you're literally, you know, coming out of the toilet or, or, or someone. You don't need to lather up your body. It's just not necessary because uh, you're, you're taking off the top layer of fat of your skin, which is, by the way, a protective layer and part of the the whole system that interplays with the skin microbiome. So um, warm water on the skin is marvellous for the shower and so on. You save a lot on soap and all these body liquids and things. Uh, and if you do apply something, use safer products. Yeah. So um, people shower quite often in warm water. Warm water, I understand, opens the pores to your skin. Then they put soaps on their body that have nasty chemicals and then get out of the shower and rub some more creams and lotions and things so it's it's even worse i guess if you're well, it's, well, that's my thinking if you do it after a hot shower or during a hot shower oh absolutely absolutely uh, you know it's and it's there are certain situations that always exacerbate it another and like what you just described there but another classic is is the the 
Um, antiperspirants, the constant use of antiperspirants under the most sensitive area near the breast, ladies. Um, you know, it's, it, and you're applying these chemicals which alter the whole microbiome of your underarm. Yep, you've got one there. Uh, and they also alter, um, you know, these chemicals are able to get through and they, they block the elimination of toxins under the arm. And antiperspirants, without any doubt, are linked with breast cancer. So uh, what, what, I, what I constantly turn around to people and say, well, look, come on, use, use a deodorant. Um, so if, and and, and, and what's, what's funny now is people must smell 10 times worse because they use their underarm deodorant and so on 10 times more than what they used to, antiperspirants. So use safer products, use it less frequently, and, and try and go without just a little bit. Trust me. It doesn't matter a little bit of body odor, a little bit of perspiration. It doesn't matter. And it will help your body get back into its own rhythm of things um, by using less and going without just a little bit. I know people uh, probably think, geez, I smell, but, well, at least I'm healthy. And your body, like you said, can can regulate itself. And, you know, there's all our natural pheromones too. (laughs) Absolutely. For dating. (laughs) Um, Peter, thank you so much. It, you have given so much incredible value. Like I felt like it, there's been a fire hydrant turned on um, with information that has been coming out. I will link in the show notes to your social media and where people can find you and the name of the, the book, The Cosmetics and Personal Personal Care Dangerous Beauty, because I think that is such a great resource and a link to where people can find more of you and your books and online courses. Thank you so much for your time. It's been incredible. Oh, look, it's an absolute pleasure. And I really hope people can get to our talks. We're, you know, we're touring around Australia. We're going to do about 100 talks this year. So um, we're actually coming into a town near you. So, you know, we, we just encourage people to come along because they walk out going, wow, I've opened my eyes. And that's what you've done here, Fatima. I I know between you and I, we'll, we'll get there and we'll open people's eyes to uh, the real issues so that we can actually really tackle them. So thank you for this opportunity. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Peter. I really, really appreciate your time. And I'll definitely post links for the people can find where you're also going to be speaking to come and learn some more from you personally. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I truly hope you have found it beneficial and have taken some value from it. Hopefully, a lot. If you did, please, please share this show with anyone you feel may need to hear it. I would also absolutely love if you would take a minute or two to review this show on iTunes, Stitcher, or whichever platform you happen to be listening to it on. With your help, we can accomplish my mission to positively impact 10 million lives. That would be so awesome. Now, if you want to connect with me or my guests on other platforms, or if you want to send me an email with questions or ideas of guests to interview, please check out the show notes. I am so incredibly grateful to have had your time today, and I can't wait to have you on the next episode. Have a great day.